back here and with Marco Bassetto. Okay, so what do we do here? So, time and consistency. Remember what that is? Is that what you think today that is best to do tomorrow is not what you think tomorrow that is best to do tomorrow. Okay, so essentially meaning that decisions are no longer decisions. The way to think of decisions is some form of a strategic interaction with your future selves. So what, do we, what happens then? You can think of this as a game with your future selves. And like all things, games, they have track loads of equilibrium. So there are essentially two ways of proceeding. One is a mark of equilibrium, which means only relevant things can happen. And the other one is to come up, and these things are pretty nasty, meaning the outcomes are not nice. Like everybody's a jerk to everybody else type of thing. You cannot have good institutions because you backstab any attempt to have good behavior. I'll show you what I mean. Alternative, so what game theories come up is with trigger strategies that essentially operate like this. If you ever, 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 ever don't do what they tell you, we're going to blow up the world. If you will blow up the world, so do I, and that's an equilibrium. So, Traditionally, either bad things happen or you enforce them with ridiculous things. Ridiculous things that involve, essentially, things that are not renegotiation proof. So what we're going to do today is we show that there is something in between. In between something that, has, that only requires that you worry about the fundamentals, but you don't have to enforce them with this demands that your children are born with the <coughs> obligation to blow up the world if you are in that uh, path of the tree. So we're going to propose this equilibrium concept where that is a little bit of a uh, thing, a little bit more well, you know, not only you do things, but you have to well, then you start some uh, organization, you propose a plan, and this plan has to involve telling everybody else that comes later what to do. But we have to worry about people that come later that they can either go along, follow the proposal, say, no, thank you, I'll do it myself, or do nothing, be a jerk, and let in somebody else restart. Okay, so those of you that are old enough, of which there's nobody, almost nobody here, you've seen overlapping generations models of money, imagine the kind of thing that is an issue is that you're the first old to print a picture with your, you print, take your picture, you print it, you call it money, and you ask the next guy for goodies. So that wouldn't be an equilibrium, because that would be a proposal that you propose these other guys, why don't you trade money that has my picture in exchange for goods, and this overcomes the problem of trade. But if I, I talk to Paolo, can you do that? I say, you know, Victor, that's a great idea, but I don't need you because he would instead use the picture with his face rather than mine and give me nothing. So we want to make sure that the type of things that, that can happen involve the, the willing participation of future guys when they can say yes or say no and do something else, whatever, or they can even wait and let somebody else start. And we call this organizational equilibrium that involves these two particular conditions. And what are the properties of this thing? The problem of this thing is, is that the way we think the world is, is, is no one can treat herself specially. There's no such a thing as the lucky ones of the first generation that get away with murder. Because if there were, the second guys would say, well, why not me? Well, why not me? If you can do it, so could I. Okay, so, so a, a key clear on property is that nobody can treat herself specially. If, in a sense that if, if it were, then the next generations would do it. Then the next thing, and this is a beautiful property that we discovered, is that goodwill and cooperation has to build slowly. You cannot just start a system in a very good spot. You have to suffer a little bit to get there. And this is going to be to give operational meaning to a notion of reputation. So we use reputation a lot, and the only way, 
the only, or at least the only place where I think it has the, before us, I mean, <laughs> let me show, let me, let me get a little bit aud audacious here. Typically, reputation means I have to tell you how tough I am. You, I could be a tough or wimpy, I'm gonna chop off my finger like a Yakuza to show you that I'm a tough guy. Okay, so that I'm going to reveal that. And so reputation is about revealing something that is unknown. Here we are not going to have anything like that. A reputation is established pattern of good behavior that is necessary to get good outcomes. So when you think of an institution, a central bank, a government, a parliament of having good reputation, we're not going to mean that they have some obs an observed characteristic that they've taken time to show it's of a certain time. What we mean is that it's going to, they have behaved in a certain way that allow good things to happen. When I claim that this is an outcome of our equilibrium concept, that is very well suited to see the advantages of many modern countries, of many developed countries in terms of having reliable institutions. Right? There's nothing special about the tap. It's not that, that Mr. Powell is a nicer guy who, of, than whoever Argentinian guy is today. It's just because they haven't done stupid things in the past, they can do better things now, even if they were identical people, okay? Okay, so if we compare with Markov equilibrium, which is a better known one, it, the payoff will only depend on payoff relevant variables, like Markov equilibrium. But the actions can depend on history. That's the, that's the key thing. So the payoffs are like markup, but the actions are not. And compared with three guys' strategies, we're going to allow to abolish history. So we don't have to kill each other. So one of the things that our agents can do is say we, we are not obliged. Well, let, me, let me go a step backward. In game theory, you have a branch of the tree, you create a strategy, it's a mapping from history into actions, blah, blah, blah. But once you're in a branch of the tree, you're a slave. You're a slave of what has happened and your children has to, have to be, just because something happened, the children have to do something stupid. They cannot renegotiate. Here, a key thing that we have is that history can be restarted at any point. You can throw everything out the window, do a good, nice revolution and, and get rid from all this obligations of your parents, no need to be killing each other. But this, what we do also has a translation in terms of game preferred refinement, which is we restrict the punishment or the trigger that you can use for the subgame perfect to have the same continuation value on or off the equilibrium path. And, and this is related to an obscure paper by Narayana called Risk Consideration Proof and we extend it to a model class of capital. Where we impose the additional condition that is not there, which is an equilibrium condition is that something nice cannot be an equilibrium if you're better being a jerk and letting the, the next guy start. And that's the notion, that's a condition, that's a requirement that in practice prevents going, jumping to a good outcome too fast. Or you can choose to throw your reputation out the window. You know, I'm saying you can do stuff from, from and then by abolishing here, so you have not behaved nicely in that sense, so you can do that. So we're going, we put some numbers into this, and I'm gonna show you in two contexts, one, the, the simplest model of time inconsistency, I'm gonna show you to do that, but then in a taxation, in a standard taxation model of the ones we use to have a positive theory of policy, and one thing that we show is that it's actually it's much closer to Ramsey than to Markov, in the sense that this equilibrium concept happens to solve many of the nastiness of Markov equilibria, which is the reason why we don't use it. So if, if you go to the two rooms down there, the monetary policy guys, they are out of their minds. Because they're thinking of decision makers that don't make decisions. They follow, they follow the this timeless perspective or something, but they don't do that. They make decisions as what we're gonna say is that under our theory, we can understand their actions as the outcome of actual decision making, not at the outcomes of some wet dream of uh, 
good behavior as they do. Okay, uh, this is 45 minutes, that's it. So let me tell you in the context of, uh, of uh, this, the simplest model how this works. So this is the growth model except for this delta. You have prevalent consumption, but this is time inconsistent. What happens? You're always impatient between today and tomorrow, but not between tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. So essentially, it's a preference where you change your mind. As of today, you discount tomorrow at a rate delta beta, but you discount between tomorrow and the after tomorrow at a rate beta. But when tomorrow comes, you discount it at a rate beta delta. Okay, think of the simple example, log utility and full depreciation production function. So the question is what happens in here? When delta equals one is a standard growth model that you, that you can, that you teach in first year macro. The nice thing about this example are many things, but one of them is that the macro equilibrium has a closed form solution. I have to go fast over this, but you do it, you do the envelope condition and blah, blah, and it ends up Two things happen. The other equation, which I, we wrote here in a, in a compact way, says, says marginal utility of consumption today equals discount of marginal utility of consumption tomorrow. But when delta is not one, this thing in red shows up. What is this thing in red? The thing in red is your understanding that if you save a little bit more, you're going to change the behavior of that asshole that follows you that is going to save too little. You know that tomorrow you is going to be impatient and you want to help your day after tomorrow you. And you're going to do that by manipulating. Manipulating is just a word, by shaping the action of tomorrow's guy and seven, giving them a little bit more. And that is captured by here. Okay, this is standard. This is called generalized solar equation because it's a difference equation that is not, not only has a decision rule G of K, but also the derivatives of the deficient rule in here. That's the notion of strategic. If I save, that never happens in competition. In competition, if I change my behavior, I cannot affect the world. Prices are given. In this strategic environment, if I change my behavior, I can change the behavior of the next guy. How do I do that? If I save more, tomorrow's guy will be a little bit richer, and as a result, will save a little bit more. So I take as given tomorrow's decision rule, not tomorrow's decision. Okay, so think of it if you are very old as a form of playing Stackelberg against your future selves. Well, the next thing is that in this example, this collapses to a closed form solution, where you save in the mark of perfect equilibrium, where you're playing against your future selves. That way, it's a constant saving rate where the constant is a function of the three parameters, which is patience, the time and consistency parameter, and the curvature of the production function. And if you see if this, when delta equals one, this collapses to what we teach with the closed form solution. Okay? So this is how it is. So how would the Ramsey guy do? The Ramsey is a nasty. The Ramsey is a brutal boss that can enforce behavior. So the Ramsey is the guy who says, I discount the future tomorrow, but nobody else can. And not only that, I'm only going to make you do as I say. That's Mr. Ramsey, freaking fascist, as you can find one. <laughs> so if you can have the power to enforce that behavior on the future guys, what would you tell them to do? Well, what you tell them to do is, I save little, but you save lots. And how much little? According to my data beta. The delta beta. How much the other guys save? According to beta alone. This Ramsey guy, this first period, saves less than the Markov guy. Because the Markov guy understands that the next guy is such a jerk, I better give them a little bit extra because it's going to be, I'm going to suffer a little bit because that next guy is, not, is going to save too little. But the, Markov, the Ramsey guy saves too little today and, sorry, saves where it is. The, the first period is not here, but from tomorrow on, it saves, tells everybody to save more. Okay, these are the two things. And clearly, what happens is that the Ramsey guy makes future guys say more about the Markov. Okay, so what are the elements that we have? Well, this is our guys are going to propose a sequence of saving rates. Tells, okay guys, let's do the following. Let me tell you a sequence of saving rate and I'm 
say, I say that, and he's next. I says, hmm, what can I do? Well, he can choose to be Mr. One, and which means go along and pass to Aloysius the plan, and then Aloysius could choose to be Mr. Two. That's one option that he has. Another option that he has is says, oh, that's great, but thank you for the idea. I'll be Mr. Zero, and ignore me. Or he can say, you know what, I'm going to let Aloysio be Mr. Zero, and I'm going to do best figuring out what Aloysio would do. These are all the things he can do. Okay, but if he chose to follow what I say, this is what he will do to save as zero. Aloysio will save as one, and then the next capital will be save K2, and that's the, that thing that the sequence of the proposal just generates the whole equilibrium path. The nice thing about this, this object is then to do the algebra, which is in this case is very simple, and it has the form, it has this form, which is separable in the initial capital and the, and the sequence of proposals. Okay, when I write it again, it's to say the total payoff of, of, of what it is for him, or for me, sorry, it's a, or for whomever, <laughs> to have payoff for whomever is a state there and a continuation payoff. We call this a separability property between capital and saving rates. And it is for this economy where we can speak. We don't have a lot to say about non separable economies. We cannot characterize things. However, we can approximate them with separable economies. I'll come back to that later. So, the question is, can the Ramsey outcome be implemented? Which is, I behave nasty, sort of the Marco, worse than Marco, and I tell him, be Ramsey. Yeah, he says, no, he's gonna do it himself. So the Ramsey cannot be. By copying my proposal, he can do better. Saying, I'll, I'll be, I'll save little, but you save a lot. He say, no, I can do it. Just doing exactly that would do me better. Okay, so it cannot be implemented. Can a constant rate be implemented? Let's do all the same thing. Well, you look into that, and then you can describe the, the, the value or the payoff of doing that, and it has this form. And in order to be followed, the only chance is as if one would be implemented, it had to be the best. Because if it wasn't the best, he would implement the best. So for sure, the only one that has a candidate is to implement the best of all constants. Okay, you follow me? So let's look at them. So this is, we plot them, and it turns to be like that. So this is the candidate. The question is, can this be implemented? This is what we would like. Can we start afresh and do the first thing that we could? Okay? But the answer is, it cannot be. And why not? Because if this can be implemented, the best thing I can do is be a jerk and let him do it. And that's the sense which you need to build up the goodwill. The goodwill is saying, we're not going to be there immediately. I'm going to do a little bit more than here, and then slowly climb up in a way that nobody wants to do something. Nobody wants to deviate, copy, or delay. Okay, and I want to be relatively fast in here, which says constant proposal cannot be implemented because of this condition, because what it says is that this is the, the, the payoff of a constant proposal, but it's worse than letting the next guy do the constant proposal and maybe in Markovian or, or maximizing against that. But there's something else that can be implemented, which converges to a star, which is in the limit we can get there, but we can get slowly. How do we get slowly? We get slowly in a way where, no, where this equation is satisfied, that this is a different equation. And that is what we call organizational equilibrium. So formally, a proposal has to be, an, to be an, an equilibrium has to be weakly increasing, which is, you know, everybody can, this is just saying, Everybody wants to go along, and the first guy doesn't choose to 
to wait. It's not better off being a jerk and letting the second guy start it. And among all those, the best one is the one that we call the equilibrium. And it is the outcome of a subgame perfect equilibrium. This is not saying much since everything is subgame perfect in this world. And the key thing is that it's a way of thinking that it's the subgame perfect where the trigger that you use to enforce it is restarted. It's not a nuclear conflagr the nuclear war. It's not there. It's not the, I call the nuclear option. It's just saying breaking the cards and starting afresh. Okay? And uh, yes, that's what. What I want to say here is to construct it, what do we do? To construct it, we construct this a difference that we, as a function of V, and this would be the stationary allocation, the value associated to the best constant, to the best constant strategy. Okay, the one associated to S star. And we're saying, what can be the sequence of these things associated to play Markov at the beginning? So we have a difference equation that has two end conditions. One condition is that you end up here. The second condition is that your initial behavior has to make you indifferent between letting the guys later start it or you starting yourself. And that would do it. Okay, so how would I want to show it? Yep. I just don't want to say more. So in terms of, of the graph, is this, think of this as the best star. Think of this as the Markovian. The equilibrium path will be you start here and you move slowly up here. Now, and where do we converge to? We converge to, to S star. So what is this S star? S star is also the, the outcome of asking everybody, which saving rate would you like to have if both you and future guys were to have the same? That's the way to do this. So say, let's agree on the rules. If we, if we all where to agree on the rules and behave the same way. And I'm going to give up my right to be a jerk in exchange of future guys giving up the right to be a jerk. What would we choose? That's a star. That's a country with good institutions where the, the government or the central bank doesn't print money like crazy, where the government doesn't backstab with huge capital taxation. That is that, okay? Now, if you, you can only be here if you have done that for a while. But if you start from scratch, and we cannot get up here. Why is that? Because I'll be the last jerk and let the next guys, I will be here and let the next guy start. So that's just the notion of the equilibrium concept. Okay? So this other, another way of, of saying this is that this equilibrium has to be robust to this notion of thank you for the idea, I do it myself. Goodwill has to be built gradually. And it's a lot better than Markov equilibrium. If you compare steady states, and this is uh, this just to get a sense quantitatively of this thing. When delta equals one, everything's the same. Time inconsistency disappears. Think of the steady state as delta goes close to zero in terms of the amount of capital steady state. Okay, when delta equals zero, nobody saves in the first few. There's no way to save. Right? As delta is somewhere in between. The S star associated to our equilibrium concept is much closer to the Ramsey, to what you think is nice, than the, you guys from Markovian. This sense of Markovian, everybody's a jerk and such bad outcomes happen. So this gives you a, a, yes, a physical sense of the quantitative differences implied by two equilibrium objects. Think of that in transition. Transition is also in Yep. You sac you're, you're not sacrificing a lot. Just saying, no. You're doing, you're, you are indifferent between being Markovian and, and letting the next guy start or doing what you're doing. You make a, pro this is a proposal that you want to do. So it's like, a, follow this and you can do better, and we can all do better. But everybody has an incentive to break things down. Nobody is, nobody is Mother Teresa here. Okay, I don't know if nobody's my interested, but they're not restricted to.
being that thing where we're always nasty, nasty. So saying, I can, do I can get a certain somewhere by being, be by being nasty. So I can do better by suffering a little bit and telling you to suffer a little bit more, but it's already benefiting from me having suffered. And by doing that, you build this collection of goodwill that ends up going up there. And in terms of transition, think of we start with the, think of this as the mark of equilibria, the level of seven rate of mark of equilibria. The, the saving rate on the Ramsey is save as little or even less than that, and then jump up there. This one says suffer a little, start suffering a little bit now, but you gain from the future good behavior, and it's, it's going up there. So it's something that is worthwhile. It's worthwhile for me, and it's better for everybody else, because they wake up with higher capital. Okay, and this is in terms of saving rates and in terms of capital also. You, you get that. Okay. See the payoffs? Okay, I don't want to talk about this. I think it's too hot and too late in the afternoon to go over the theory of a weekly separable economy. This is, this is, so I'm not going to go over that. Yeah, this is just the, the kind of thing you need to get, survive the, the filtering of the theories by what they're saying. This example can be written in proper game theory language. And it applies to a particular class of environments that are separable. What are separable? Well, you can say the payoff is a function between some set of actions and the state. And as long as you can do that, we are fine. OK. And, it's, and as I said, it's related to this Narayana's reconsideration proof, except once you add a state variable, we, also, we, we add state variables, but we have two other equilibrium conditions, which is the ability to delay which is some, some pure narrow game theories. It's like, well, you're changing the game. In a way, we are changing the game. We're changing the game of saying history starts tomorrow. It has to be in the interest of agents to say, I'm not agent zero, I mean, I'm agent minus one. And history starts tomorrow, but they have concerns over that. That has to be part of the, of the set of strategies. Okay, and this is repeating myself a little bit. In uh, Equilibria exists, and it has a nice recursive behavior where instead of proposing all the, thinking of proposing all the sequences, you can write of it as a, as a sequence of actions with a fixed point, which is the best possible. Now, the question is how separable, how pervasive are separable economies? Not very. They're actually very rare. So in the context of our example, depreciation kills the parability. Okay? So what happens? So what we think happens is that there is, we can, <coughs> the same way that in macro, we don't, we don't solve for the equilibrium of an economy because we don't know how to do it. We solve the equilibrium of an approximated economy that's our strategy here. We're going to look for the equilibrium of an economy, of a separable economy that approximates the original one. Truth be said, the class of separable economies is smaller than the class of, say, linear quadratic economies that we use to approximate ones. But still, we can approximate many into certain degrees of accuracy, and we go on and do that. Okay, and we spend lots of times, lots of times struggling to how to think of a general, of a general, um, not very successfully of a general approximation strategy that is very, very useful, but we are pretty happy with the set of approximations we can can. So even though depreciation, linear depreciation is non-separable, there are forms of depreciation with curvature that are separable that, that locally look like the like the economy that we have. Putting this to action, this is inconsistent. The nice thing about the example I had before is that it's very simple, and it's a game between me and my future selves without intermediating <laughs> anybody. But time inconsistency is important, not because people have time-varying preference, but because the government has incentives. The government's policy induces incentives of the private sector, 
and those incentives, meaning future policy affects current behavior, makes government policies subject to time inconsistency. You can see that. That's one the same thing with monetary policy. You know, whatever you'll do tomorrow affects today's behavior. You need a theory of what we're going to do tomorrow, and we need announcement of theories that, of policies in the future that are credible. <laughs> That's a sense of which uh, I'll come back to that. So th let's look at a simple version, which is imagine a government that has to pro that provides a public good. Okay, so the households care about a private and a public good, and it's going to, and can only pay for it with a period by period balanced by the constraint on capital income. So the simplest case of that. What makes this harder than before? is that, that the government has to understand that any policy that it chooses induces a competitive equilibrium on the behavior of households, and we have to take that into account. So it has another nested um, object to be determined, which is how the, public, the, how the private sector responds to government policy. So the, so the, private, the, the private sector has a, government by the, has a budget constraint that says, uh, whatever transfers you get, and the consumption plus savings equals after tax, after tax uh, earnings. Uh, prices, governed by the constraint. So this is the key thing. Now you have to deal with the competitive equilibrium concept. Sorry, so, the, T, the T path is picked at the beginning of time? Well, when, when would that, what do you mean by that? I don't, I don't know, I'm just trying to understand the, the tau thing. The whole thing is a tax rate. No, I know, but, but the whole path is picked. With the of course, no, that's the whole point. What is a government? <coughs> What's the only requirement that we want from a government? And then I'm going to abuse you a little bit. Give me, just okay. to keep everybody awake. Sure. A government only right is to govern. Government means makes decisions. Means it doesn't have to do whatever the previous government told it to do. So, so in equilibrium, you, you know what the sequence of those things are but you have to make sure that every government complies happily. Okay, so the first government tells, writes down it's a sequence of tax rates and says, hopefully these things will happen. And it has to be that when the next government comes, looks at them and say, yeah, I could erase them and put others, but it's happy to go along. That's the, the nature here. What is different from before is that there is a private sector in between that reacts accordingly and they, and they will have to forecast Things and whatever I write here, it has to be both the private sector and the future governments have to believe that that is going to happen. Right. Okay. The way the private sector behaves is going to be summarized by the Euler equation, which says marginal utility of consumption today equals marginal utility of consumption tomorrow, net of taxes and with the rate of return. So what happens here? Remember, you would like to have governments like the public good. It's a good government, like the public good. So they would like to put a lot of public good today because public good is good. But tomorrow is not so good. And the reason why it's not so good tomorrow is the only way to pay for it with capital income taxes. And if tomorrow you put a lot of public good, then people are going to save very, very little to avoid paying taxes tomorrow. Okay, so one, what's going to happen in our equilibrium is today's government's not going to tax a lot. It's going to tell everybody, go easy on taxes, sacrifice the public good, and it's going to sustain this lower taxation over time. Okay, and we do, how are we doing on time? I think 15, I, minutes. 15 minutes, I want to put you fine. So this is just a sequence of, of um, so we just follow the same strategy as before. And we are going to have a sequence of taxes to be an equilibrium is the value that you propose is weakly increasing, the implementability constraint satisfied, meaning it's an equilibrium from the point of view of the private sector, and the government again has no incentive to delay the proposal, which means you don't have to rewrite history, you don't want to say um, abuse it. And this is what the reputations do. This is what we think the reputations do. If you could go immediately, there's such a thing as the same constant relatively low taxation. 
If we could do that from the beginning, we would. But if you don't have a history of having done that, what the, what the governments would like to do is tax a lot today and let the next guys do it. So this reputation has been gained slowly. The central bank has to maintain low inflation rates slowly to end up going and having low inflation rates forever. Because if you could generate inf low inflation rates today, what the, what the central bank should do is say, okay, this is the last year of high inflation, and tomorrow's guys will do the low inflation. Okay. So how does it look? Look at this. This is the, this is the, think of the mark of tax as a very high tax because you're not internalizing at all the fact that people are saving little as a result of your tax. Think of this, the Ramsey, the Ramsey tax, some form of a tax that doesn't take into account whatsoever what you want today. Think of Tau Star, the tax rate that you would choose in a world where you choose a constant one, and you actually, if everybody were to choose the same, which is the one that you would like to choose, and that is your weight in the fact that the first period is non-distortionary with the fact that future periods is distortionary, so you choose a little bit higher taxes than the Ramsey, and what ends up happening is that, according to our logic, is that the initial tax rate is tau zero, somewhere in between the two, and then slowly the government stops tax in reducing taxes over time and converging to tau star. And you can see it in a, this way, just looking at it. Of course, in all these economies, just to tell you, you cannot solve for equilibria for the steady state by itself. And the reason is that you have to imagine how non-steady state behavior would look like to end up choosing something. Okay, so in competitive equilibrium, you don't need to worry of equilibrium path because you have no power over it. But in all these policy environments, you have to at least envision how would the world look if you were to do something different? So, so stationary allocations are not independent of non-stationary, cannot, cannot be solved independently of non-stationary allocation. Okay, so, yes, exactly. What I want to show you now is there are different versions depending on taxation and leisure, but I want to show you a couple of tables to finish that. So think of, these are, these are numbers that have some sense. So, Imagine we normalized an economy to a particular taste of the, of the public good. Imagine the economy has no distortions. You could have lump sum taxes. In such a world, the wealth to upper rate would be three, upper would be one, consumption would be 0.6, but government expenditure would be 0.18. This is what you like to have, okay? But this will only be possible if you could tax lump sum, okay? When consumption to public to private, sorry, private to public, it would be unconditionally optimal at 3.2, and leisure at 0.32, and of course, it's lump sum tax. What would the Ramsey guy choose eventually? He will choose, with only a labor income tax, there's no issue of the temporal distortion, no issue on the temporal distortion. There's only an issue of labor distortion, okay? And he will choose tax rate of 0.28. The mark of equilibria will be very similar. So these static economies that uh, doesn't have a, a huge role, the difference between Ramsey, Markov, and organization, they're all pretty similar. Why is that? Because the, only the distortions come, they have no dynamic nature, so there's no big deal. But when we have capital income tax, things change. Now taxing is expensive, it's very distortionary, and the Ramsey government is willing to reduce government expenditures by two-thirds in order to get, to get the optimal allocation. Markov, because you have no, none of these considerations of your own tax and distorting previous decisions, has a, much, has a higher tax rate, as high as 0.78% to enforce that, and results in a much lower capital output rate and a much higher rate of return. Okay, so the question is this is we know this, so our, our approach, our notion of equilibrium, what's the long run 
tax rate is 6.6. .6. Look at how much closer to Ramsey is. Okay, so it can achieve much better outcomes with only with a slight increase in that. So what do we think of this? And let me finish with less with the technical thing, but more of a, with a commercial. I like to have commercial. So, so what, what is policy? Policy is what we do in a way. And this we do economics, I want to do policy. So one of the things is that we want to have a theory of policy. So it's a sense in which normative economics is a little bit oxymoronic in, in many ways. But we want to say is what type of mechanisms are, are, or what type of institutions are likely to yield different types of policy. And traditionally, every time we put a policy, either it's monetary policy or fiscal policy, we have to think of how could these things happen. And the tools to look at them were Markov, trigger strategies, or commitment. I think the three of them, the Markov is pretty bad. That's why economists have to stay away from that, because the outcomes that the policy generating institutions get are awful. So we don't want to have that. So the second thing is to think of them as normative or Ramsey policy, which are a lunacy because they can only be supported by some kind of triggers, which require the collaboration of yet to be born people and require the willingness of future agents never to renegotiate. It's just insane. Finally, they assume commitment. Assuming government commitment is, a more, is immoral. The whole point of view of governments is that they are governments. Okay, governments are maybe constrained by constitution, but certainly they are not constrained by, by desires of previous governments. What we think we're doing with here is provide a way of thinking of policies that have a natural, have reasonable outcomes, and it's in a theoretically sound way, it's much better than Markov and it provides a natural interpretation to the notion of, of reputation, to the notion that governments cannot be born overnight, that good behavior of previous governments that following, uh, how you call it, following the rules that they've been following in the past of not backstabbing and behaving, uh, and behaving nicely pay off, and this is the outcome of the thing. They can be solved provided you're willing to approximate with a separable economy, the original one. And that's, that's all I wanted to say. So I understand it seems like the notion of the organization agreement is perhaps unimaginable and other notions. But you say it's, it looks like it provides better, what do you mean by better? Better, better, better outcomes. Better outcomes. So one of the reasons then I think many people do not use Markov equilibria. Markov equilibria, they used to be hard, but we're getting better at doing things, so they are not hard. But they just look like nasty outcomes. Like central banks inflating up the wazook. That's why people like Woodford come from this, by assuming this thing of timeless perspective, assuming that somehow magically they are endowed with a different objective function that other people and they're following this timeless perspective. Nobody knows where it's coming from, or, what, or why would they follow that? So I said, we don't have to go into that wishful thinking, and we can think of outcomes according to here that do not have the nasty outcomes that uh, Markov monetary policy would do. Perhaps at some point we should look at the Markov, at the monetary policy context to show like, the continuous inf backstabbing of inflation of high inflation that, that is the result of, a, of a optimal policy. In a, optimal, um, the Markovian notion of, opt, of optimizing central bankers, it doesn't look like that's what they do. So part of the reason to don't use them is that central bankers seem to be doing nicer things than what Markov equilibrium yields. And so the same thing is with taxation. Yeah, yeah, I meant the second. I meant the second. <laughs> I meant the second, not the first. Yes, yes. The, the, 
there are better ways to understand what people, what actual governments do. They seem to behave better than the backstabbing outcomes that we tend to impute to microbacteria. They are not. I mean, microbacteria is not completely shooting yourself in the in the foot because remember you said a little bit more at the beginning because you know that later government are there, but in some contexts they can be pretty bad. Like monetary policy, this one is much better. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks.